Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. In order to win a battle, you can't just rely on advanced technology and weapons and manpower. You also need a really good strategy and plan. So today, we'll be taking a look at five terrific battle strategies we see in science fiction. Grand Admiral Thrawn is by far one of the best tacticians in Star Wars and most likely one of the best on this list today. He's extremely cunning and well prepared both intellectually and physically for any challenge. But more importantly, the Triss warrior didn't have much of an ego and more importantly, he didn't pursue power or fame or money. Thrawn was first and foremost a student of the game. He lived and breathed warfare 24-7. When he wasn't training his crew to act as extensions of himself, he spent hours looking at the artwork of his enemies so that he could better understand how they thought. To some of his enemies, Thrawn was like some kind of omnipotent demon. Forces underneath his command were usually extremely efficient, well-coordinated, deadly, and most frightening, able to predict the movements of their enemies. But of course, Thrawn wasn't some magical being with special force powers. He was just extremely, extremely well prepared for almost any situation. Now, most of you know Thrawn as the Grand Admiral, but before he joined the Empire, he was a commander in his own people's Chiss Expansionary Defense Force. The Chiss were located in the unknown region of the galaxy. Although it was sparsely populated, the aliens that did wander the sector of space often evolved isolated from outside contact and were equal parts terrifying and mysterious. The Chiss Defense Force had to be very unpredictable and flexible in order to combat all of these unknown entities. Five years after the Battle of Naboo, the Jedi created an exploratory mission known as Outbound Flight. Their mission was to lead a few hundred colonists towards the edge of the galaxy and then beyond. The mission was led by the powerful Jedi Master, Joris Chabaoth. He believed that Force-sensitive individuals were superior to others and had a mandate to rule. Little did Joris Chabaoth realize Supreme Chancellor Palpatine saw this outbound flight mission as a perfect opportunity to murder a bunch of Jedi without anyone realizing. So as outbound flight continued its journey to the edge of the galaxy with 18 Jedi on board, Chancellor Palpatine contacted the Trade Federation and had them create a fleet to intercept the Jedi mission. The unknown region was only sparsely populated by life. There were, however, tons of gravitational anomalies that made navigation and communication difficult. And so if the Trade Federation manages to intercept outbound flights while in the unknown region, it'd be very hard for anyone to find out. Unfortunately for Special Task Force 1, Commander Thrawn's unit, Picket Force 2, was also in the area. Now, Thrawn was completely outgunned in this situation. He had only three Chiss assault cruisers, which were around only 100 meters long, and nine Chiss heavy fighters, whereas the Trade Federation had two Lucra Hulk-class battleships, six hard cell class transports, seven escort cruisers, and over 3,000 vulture droids. You essentially had a state-of-the-art private navy facing off against what was the equivalent of a Chiss Coast Guard unit. But the Trade Federation commander, Vice Roy Cav, was hardly a competent military leader. He also completely underestimated the puny Chiss fleet. You see, although Thrawn's fleet was small, he loved new technology, and one of his hobbies was collecting all sorts of weapons from different species and incorporating them into his own force. This made the Chiss extremely unpredictable, even if you're used to fighting your species. Now, the Trade Federation starts their attack against Thrawn's forces by launching a massive wave of vulture droids at him. Now, Thrawn doesn't really know exactly how these droids are going to function, so he decides to test the water and slowly retreat away from them. The Chiss commander quickly learns that these vulture droids have a limited range and need to return back to their ship once they've traveled away from it too far. And so Thrawn has one of his own fighters fly into range of these vulture droids and quickly fly out of range. This causes the vulture droids to react to Thrawn's ship, which is exactly what he wants to do. You see, he's trying to figure out how to hijack the broadcast signal that the Trade Federation is using for the droids. The Trade Federation were still using remote controlled units by this point. They hadn't really learned from the Battle of Naboo just quite yet. Now, once Thrawn hijacks the signal, he basically can hijack all the vulture droids and he sends them flying into deep space. The remaining droids that are left are dispatched by the Chiss's Connor nets. These are essentially massive nets launched in missile form. They would spread out and would shock and disable any ship caught inside of it. They worked like an ion cannon, but at a much larger area of effect. The Trade Federation now had lost the good portion of their fighter fleet, and more importantly, their entire fleet was now blocked by debris from what used to be their fighter fleet. 
So the next thing Viceroy Cav does is have his hard cell transports fire missiles at the Chiss fleet. Thrawn simply fires more conning nets, which causes the missiles to explode and damage other hard cell ships. Very soon, most of the Trade Federation fleet is laying in ruins. Only one capital ship is left. Thrawn's ability to destroy a force that was more than 20 to 30 times his size was impressive enough to gain the attention of Emperor Palpatine. Whether Thrawn realized it or not, this small battle on the edge of the galaxy was his job interview for a future position in the Empire. The destruction of Special Task Force 1 would be one of Thrawn's finest commands, although he would also later be responsible for creating what's known as the Thrawn Pincer Move, which is really cool, but maybe we'll cover that in our other channel, Generation Tech, next time. Now, I know no one ever asked for the Battleship movie, which is a really random board game tie-in movie that also serves as sort of a Navy recruitment video, but what it does show us is some very important lessons about battlefield strategy that we could apply to almost any situation. Now, humans have a very limited view of the galaxy, and that's because we are limited to basically just one planet and one species. So it's very easy for us to view uh, technology in a very linear term. Newer things are always better than older ones, but in real life, that's not how things actually work. For instance, if you built combat armor that works quite well against energy weapons because the surface of the armor is good at reflecting heat, it might not work as well against more primitive weapons like arrows or firearms. In Battleship, a very advanced alien species launches a small scouting party onto our planet. The alien vessels are extremely powerful and agile, their ships are much larger than anything the US Navy has, and they could move very rapidly across the water by literally jumping out of it. At the time of this alien invasion, the United States Navy was actually carrying out military games with the Japanese Kaiju Defense Force. Three of the destroyers, the Samson, Miyoko, and John Paul Jones, are assigned to recon one of the alien crash sites. When they arrive, they are fired upon by some kind of high arcing missile projectile. Although the destroyer Sea Wiz point defense systems were able to destroy most of the incoming projectiles, some of them get through and the Samson and the Miyoko are immediately sunk. The alien ship then proceeds to launch drones on the Hawaiian mainland. Now, the biggest problem with our human destroyers is that they're missile destroyers. The John Paul Jones is our Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer. Its armament includes a variety of different long range missiles. Naval warfare today is all about long range detection, which actually does fit the board game theme of Battleship now that I think about it. Most modern ships are no longer designed for line of sight engagements. Although they might have some deck guns, the majority of their munitions are going to be long range guided missiles. This is also why giant battleships with their massive deck guns aren't really a thing anymore. While these impressive ships could knock out targets several miles away, they just weren't a match for an aircraft carrier, which could send dozens of planes from more than 100 miles away. That was the lesson we learned from World War II, and the missile destroyer is the natural evolution of naval combat. But unfortunately, the aliens could easily jam all of our guidance systems, making these weapons useless. And so, the crew of the John Paul Jones must use their brains to figure out how to track and fire upon these alien ships. One ingenious idea was to use the tsunami warning buoys around Hawaii to track the displacement of water created by the alien ship moving. With that data, the crew of the John Paul Jones could track the alien warship's trajectory and launch their own missiles to predictive coordinates that can intercept and destroy the enemy. The one part of human technology that is very advanced is our weapons technology. A Tomahawk cruise missile is still going to damage an alien ship as long as it can hit it. The crew of the John Paul Jones then uses another interesting tactic in another battle when they figure out that the aliens they're fighting are vulnerable to bright light. And so in their next encounter with an alien ship, the John Paul Jones positions itself with the sun at its back. Using anti-material rifles, the humans manage to pierce the tinted bridge windows of the enemy ship, blinding the command crew momentarily. Which gives the John Paul Jones enough time to launch five cruise missiles at the alien ship. It seems a little overkill. Unfortunately, immediately after this exchange, the John Paul Jones is torn apart by one of those crazy alien drones. But the crew still isn't out of the fight just yet. Since they're near Pearl Harbor, there's still some naval ships left, like the USS Missouri, an Iowa-class battleship built in 1940. This ship might be completely outclassed by today's standards, but it still has weapons on board, and, you know, the missile destroyers weren't really built to fight alien ships either, so... I guess it doesn't hurt bringing World War II battleship into the battlefield as well. With the help of a bunch of older veterans, the crew of the John Paul Jones gets the USS Missouri steaming full speed at the enemy. 
literally steaming because that's what powered the main power plant. Just as the alien ship is about to fire at the battleship, the crew of the Missouri drops one of the anchors and drifts the entire vessel sideways. It's kind of like pulling the e-brake on a car. Now, I doubt in real life the anchor would be able to hold that much weight, but it works in the movie and makes the alien's first volley of fire completely miss, which allows the USS Missouri to launch a full broadside salvo straight into the aliens. I don't care what part of the galaxy you're from, a 16-inch naval gun is still a 16-inch naval gun. America. Ender Wiggins is most likely the youngest commander on this list, and probably the only commander who's fought his first dozen real battles without even realizing it. You see, after an alien scout ship almost destroys the entire Earth, humanity would focus the entire world's attention on figuring out a way to defeat this alien threat. You see, the small alien invasion force's last attack was so devastating that humanity understood that if another battle was fought in their solar system against these aliens, even if humanity won, there wouldn't be much of an Earth left to live on. And so the unified leadership of the planet sent out scouts looking for some of the brightest children on the planet to train in a battle school, so that when the time comes and our forces are ready to march on the alien homeworld, we'll also have the best commanders possible. Now, for some reason, the individuals who ran battle school thought children would be better at commanding this force than adults. They assumed that children are faster learners and have much better reaction times. The one thing that they did forget was that a child might not understand the graphic and brutal nature of war. And so, Battle School tricks Ender Wiggins and his classmates into believing they're going through a series of simulations of what an invasion would look like. Little do they know, these battles they're fighting were actually happening in real life. The student's last mission, or graduation test, was actually the human invasion of the alien homeworld. Since the alien homeworld was the furthest from Earth, the fleet that had been launched there was also the oldest, and equipped with the oldest weapons. The enemy also outnumbered the human fleet like a million to one. Most individuals would have looked at this simulation and just given up. I probably would have reloaded another save file. But Ender Wiggins is not your average human being. Instead, he decides to use a proprietary weapon system humanity has developed known as the Molecular Disruption Device, or the Little Doctor. The Little Doctor essentially was a chain attack weapon. When its energy beam hits a ship, the beam quickly branches out to another ship and starts a massive destructive chain reaction. The aliens had actually learned how to adapt to this weapon by spacing their ships apart a little bit more so that the chain reaction never starts. But no one's ever used it on an actual planet. In principle, the weapon should be able to work as long as there's some mass for the weapon's field to expand with. And so Ender arranges his fleet around the Little Doctor weapon, and they plunge straight into the heart of the alien world. The enemy fighters swarming them are so thick they almost form an opaque wall in front of the human fleet. Ultimately, the plan ends up working. The Little Doctor destroys the entire planet. It's probably the only way that humanity was going to win this scenario, and somehow Ender Wiggins figured out a way to do it. One wonders if Ender would have been able to make the same sacrifices had he known that there were actually humans fighting inside the ships he was commanding to plunge into a planet. Operation Return is one of the classic space battles from Star Trek Deep Space Nine's sixth season. The situation was grim. That group of shapeshifters, the Dominion, who could basically transform themselves into anything at will and make it look really realistic, except for humans. They sucked at imitating humans. Anyway, they had come through the wormhole in vast numbers, along with their two lesser species that they controlled, the Vorta and the Jem'Hadar, and they'd also forged an alliance with the Kardashians. No, not the Kardashians, the Cardassians. Anyway, the Dominion and the Cardassians had taken control of Deep Space Nine, and Benjamin Sisko saw taking back Deep Space Nine and control of the wormhole as crucial to winning the war. The Dominion won't attack Earth. How can you be sure? Because Earth isn't the key to the Alpha Quadrant. The wormhole is. And whoever controls Deep Space Nine controls the wormhole. Somehow he manages to convince the Admirals to go with this gamble, even with Earth on the line. But he needs the help of the Klingon Defense Force. Gentlemen, this mission cannot succeed without the involvement of the Klingon Defense Forces. We agree with you, Captain. Chancellor Gowron does not. Then you will have to change his mind. The Chancellor. So he convinces Worf and General Martok to go to Kronos to personally ask Chancellor Gowron for the fleet to participate. Now, before Deep Space Nine's capture, Starfleet had been able to install a field of self-replicating mines around the wormhole to stop Dominion reinforcements coming through from the Gamma Quadrant. 
but the Cardassians had started removing these mines. And Quark, the bartender who's still on Deep Space Nine, is able to find out how long it will take. What's it gonna take? A couple months? A year? One week. A week? That's right. One week, and the Alpha Quadrant is ours. They get a message to Cisco, who is at a starbase planning his operation, and he realizes he has a quick decision to make. We take the ships we have, fight our way to Deep Space Nine, and destroy the anti graviton emitter. It's our only hope. Do it. Now, the Cardassians have been watching Federation ship movements, and they realize that Cisco has taken a fleet and is heading towards Deep Space Nine. So they pull a load of Cardassian ships off the front lines and have them intercept Starfleet. Cisco and the fleet encounter Cardassian and Dominion vessels along the way, and they realize they are outnumbered two to one. Then Cisco decides to come out with an inspiring quote. There's an old saying, fortune favors the bold. Well, I guess we're about to find out. And then, like, no one really says anything, and they're just sort of like, yeah, what, uh, what's this dude going on about? And then Cisco's like, oh, what shall I do? I know, cameraman, get an awesome shot of me sitting down in my chair. Anyway, they engage the Cardassians, and Cisco, as always, has a plan. Attack fighters. Tactical pattern theta. Concentrate your fire on the Cardassian ships, and then split off into squadrons and run like hell. Why is he only targeting the Cardassian ships? He's hoping to get them to break formation so they'll go after the Federation fighters. He knows the Jem'Hadar will stand their ground, but the Cardassians might just get angry enough to take the bait. Which would open a hole we can punch through. And in case you're wondering why there is a Cardassian on the bridge of the Defiant while they are fighting the Cardassians, that's Garrick. He's Sisko's tailor. Sisko always keeps his tailor close by. He often decides that he wants to get measured for a suit at some really weird times. Altogether, we're talking about well over 100 ships just in the first wave. Excuse me. I hope I'm not interrupting. I'd like to be measured for a new suit. Now. Right now. But Captain, I do have your measurements. Take them again. Anyway, the Cardassians have already anticipated this plan and have one of their own. Let's give him his reward, shall we? Have a half dozen squadrons break formation and go after those fighters. Now, Cisco realizes it's a trap too, but he also knows that it is his only hope of reaching Deep Space Nine, so he goes for it. They very quickly get closed in on by the Cardassians, but the Klingons turn up at just the right moment. They provide covering fire and the Defiant is the only ship that's able to break through the blockade and it speeds towards Deep Space Nine. Meanwhile, on the station, former crew members and civilians try to carry out a terrorist operation to shut down the main computer. But they're too late and the Cardassians are able to destroy the minefield. When the Defiant arrives, the ship goes into the wormhole and meets the Dominion forces head on. And then something happens to Sisko, which it seems he was perhaps counting on all along. The prophets, or those ethereal beings that live in the wormhole that the Bajorans worship as gods, make contact with him using the appearance of characters that he knows. They don't want him to sacrifice his life, and they make the entire enemy fleet disappear. Now I know, the ending of this battle is a little bit easy, perhaps even a little bit disappointing, but it doesn't come entirely out of the blue. Cisco was an emissary for the wormhole beings all along. And then the Defiant defiantly exits the wormhole alone. Deep Space Nine cannot fire on the ship because the computer has been shut down. The Cardassians and the Dominion start evacuating and 200 Starfleet ships turn up at the station. That is... Operation Return, one of the classic Star Trek Deep Space Nine battles. On to the next one. Oh, hey there, Inyo Loda. I'm here today to talk to you about The Expanse. And if you ask me for the best battlefield tactics in the show, you already know it. I gotta go with the legend, the Battle of Thoth Station. Now, people might say, whoa, 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 I didn't think that the tactics involved in that battle were that great. I mean, it's one of the coolest and most aesthetically pleasing space battles ever put on screen, but tactics? Nah, sloppy. But I think that's short-sighted if you consider the situation. Oh, what's the situation right? My job. Well, spoiler alert, basically all these bad guys from this evil company known as Amazon. 
protogen, who were responsible for a massive outbreak of the protomolecule, were hiding out on a communications relay known as Thoth Station. Anyway, the crew of the Rosinante wanted to take over this station and apprehend the douchebags who were chilling there. Problem is, the crew of the Rosinante, led by Captain James Holden, didn't exactly have a navy at their disposal for what was a highly difficult mission to occupy a station of unknown capabilities and which was under the power of a company in Protogen that had some of the most advanced weapons and ship technology known to man. Actually, not even known to man. So Captain Holden teamed up with Fred Johnson, aka Space Carl Winslow, an important leader of the OPA, a Belter faction, to put together a ragtag assault team to raid Thoth. So the odds were against them and they had to get creative. In space where there is little cover, approaching an enemy without letting them know you're coming can be tricky. As the assault team didn't have the advanced stealth technology of their enemy, they had to use disguise. And where they lacked the numbers of a navy, they had to use misdirection to keep their opponent occupied with the wrong targets. What they did is this. An OPA cargo ship known as the Guy Molinari headed out towards the station with the Rosinante hidden behind it in its radar shadow, waiting to jump out and attack. Now here's what I really liked about their tactics. They were practical. They knew they weren't going to completely fool the people on the station or the stealth frigate guarding it. They just wanted to buy themselves as much time as possible. When the Guy Molinari got close enough to Thoth, the Rosie pulled away from it, making itself appear to be some loose cargo that fell off the ship. It went into semi-freefall using only minimal directional thrust to guide itself towards the station. Yes, the stealth frigate figured out the ploy, but not before the Rosie was close enough to use its CQB strengths to zip around the station out of reach of the stealth ship's weapons. In close proximity of the station, the Rosie played nuisance to the stealth ship, keeping it from destroying the Molinari. Which, when it got close enough to Thoth, released breaching pods disguised as cargo containers at the station. Now, I know the jig was up at this point, but what could be more convincing than FedEx hurling packages at their destination as hard as possible? Yeah, they lost one of the pods when the station surprisingly popped out an anti-asteroid cannon, but hey, there was no way to know for sure what the station was capable of, and by launching two pods at the same time on the same trajectory, they made it so taking out one pod meant the other could get to the station safely. Again, they went for practical, not full-on miracle. Just like my shirt today is actually only semi-wrinkled, not fully ironed. Anyway, it helped that the Rossi, still playing the part of Pest, jumped out from inside the station's rings and took out the cannon in the stealth ship, which couldn't move around inside the station's tight quarters as well as the Rossi. The Rosinante was deployed perfectly to its advantages on this mission, and that was key here. The plan worked because Captain Holden and his crew in the OPA worked together to use what they had, including coffee, to the best of their advantage. You know what? Before I go any further here, I should do a whole video on this, shouldn't I? I should do a video where I go in depth on the Battle of Thoth Station, analyzing it down to its smallest details. I'm doing that. You know what? And you in Yoloda out there who are unsubscribed, you better hit that goddamn subscribe button so you don't miss it. Anyway, Alan, back to you. So there you have it guys, five different battle strategies used in five very different scenarios. What I really love about warfare and science fiction is oftentimes you'll see two very different races with very different technology levels facing off each other. And when these two sides are not prepared to fight each other, you're going to see a lot of interesting methods and tactics. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.